Yeah, hello, Siddharth. Hi, good afternoon, ma'am. Hi, ma'am, can you hear me? Good afternoon, good afternoon. Can you hear me and can you see me? No, ma'am, I yeah, can't yeah, see yeah. you. Yeah, 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 perfect. So yeah, okay. You know we have we have meetings in uh, in Google Meet. So like I'm not so used to Zoom. <laughs> this is like my first or the second <laughs> meeting in Zoom. In Zoom? Oh, okay. Yeah, and I've I've heard. Zoom. Yeah. Yeah, but it all they all have okay. some unique problems somewhere or the other. Yeah. <laughs> every time now we have to get used to it and yeah. webex is also there so no webex is there. we use uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, microsoft different yes we use microsoft teams at work and okay. even that has its own share of uh, problems it is very slow at times and sometimes it crashes oh. so far i think we have not received yeah. anything with the uh, in case if we have any problems we can try to switch but uh, hopefully it should be should be fine are you in uh, anaital ma'am yeah. or in lucknow no i'm in lucknow i'm in lucknow i came uh, for the shares just after the shares i joined they okay. couldn't go home because not need to be for yeah. you know the weddings so i'm here acha <laughs> yeah. yeah so ma'am uh, one second i'll just Should I share my screen? Yes, ma'am. We you can try to. Do you want to check it? Yes, ma'am. Let's try to yeah. do that. And are you keeping your camera off to save the bandwidth? Just so that the internet is yeah. better, or you have? Okay, yeah, that's fine. No, I I thought that the host has, uh, you know, disabled. Then the no, camera off. Let let me see. This you should people. be able to. No, no. You should be able Because to. Because when I'm doing that. It... Okay. Could can you see the screen now? Yes, ma'am. I can see the screen, uh, but we cannot see your camera. I have made you the co-host, so it should allow you to uh, have all the privileges. Uh, mute my audio. Is my camera? Mm. Okay, do you know? It doesn't even show me that you know. If you uh, there should be a uh, if you go to participants and you find your name, there there should be a mute and a more button. So if you click on more, it should allow you to start video. Okay. Doesn't give me many options, you know. Maybe I've installed the the very basic bit. Uh, start. Yeah. I, yeah. Now, now. Now it's working. Now you can see. Yes, ma'am. Now we can see. Now we can see. Perfect. Now it's okay. Huh? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now I can see. I don't know what. <laughs> so yeah. your slides are coming through fine. Uh, Do you have any videos or anything, or is it just images? No, no, no. Only a presentation. Okay, then it should be fine. Sometimes there are some problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So maybe, ma'am, I can. Uh, what's the time now? Yeah, maybe I, I can. I'll quickly introduce you, and then you can uh, start your presentation right after, whenever you're sure. ready. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna yeah. resume. Uh, sure. i'm going to resume recording so a very warm welcome to dr vinita ma'am vinita fartial ma'am from lucknow and to all our participants i hope they will be watching the live session as well as we are streaming on youtube as well as recording this session so it will be available this talk will be available for all the students and other researchers who are listening to us 
and uh, we are very very delighted to have with us uh, Dr. Vinita Fartial, ma'am. Uh, so Dr. Vinita is working as a scientist in Bhimbalsani Institute of Paleo Sciences in Lucknow, which is an autonomous institute under Department of Science and Technology in India since 2001. She has received her early education from Nainital in Uttarakhand, which is a hill station in Lesser Himalayan zone. For those of you who are not uh, from India, perhaps and outside, and she has a PhD degree uh, from Kumaon University in Nainital in the year 2000. From then, she was a DARD Fellow, DAAD Fellow, which is a very prestigious uh, fellowship, which is given uh, from the German uh, government. And she did her postdoctoral work at the University of Tubingen in Germany. and she learned environmental magnetic techniques she's had a chance to train in some of the best laboratories institutions and universities in india and also abroad with uh, several stints at uh, national geophysics research institute in hyderabad national institute of oceanography in goa um uh, vadia institute of himalayan geology in dehradun and many others uh, ncpor in goa so you can we can see that she has a very diverse uh, set of experience as well as geographically she has worked in you know different uh, parts of uh, the country as well as overseas and her main expertise is quaternary paleoclimate uh, geomorphology and neotectonics and even though she is a geologist by training uh, she is a very passionate field worker and she's worked in the tethian and trans himalayan region and she uh, we are very very happy to also note that she is the first indian woman to have taken part in the indian science expeditions to both the poles antarctica as well as arctic so i think that's a great achievement uh, for her and it is a privilege to know her and also get a chance to work with her and uh, she's been born and brought up in the himalayas the mountain landscape is her home ground her own territory and uh, this is where she conducts all of her research and she has been associated with the indian astrobiology group since 2016 and ever since then we have been working uh, under her guidance and uh, mainly in the ladakh region we have been trying to identify different sites where we can uh, conduct studies and her main focus has been on landscape evolution and habitation so with this introduction uh, dr vinita ma'am very warm welcome to the center of excellence astrobiology amity university our monthly webinar and uh, over to you ma'am thank you so much thank you so much siddharth yeah i'll do a slide more uh, good afternoon to all of the all the participants here all the astrobiology enthusiasts that are here um i'll be talking on the third the three poles i know you are aware of the two poles the north pole and the south pole i'll just introduce you to one more term that's the third pole and uh, before i start uh, i would like to thank amity for you know conducting such a beautiful um, this course for the our uh, young uh, students that's very much needed because we need people to do science in uh, in these uh, new uh, new uh, disciplines that are coming up um, all over the world and we need it for india also because we have such good uh, you know analog sites in india i'll be showing you some i'll be talking about or so and then we can have a discussion on this so uh, basically yeah as it has said i was I've been really lucky to have visited the arctic the antarctic and I'm working in the tibetan plateau region especially the indian side the ladakh region so i'll be talking about that i uh, am based uh, presently in uh, bigwasani institute of paleo sciences it is a uh, autonomous research institute of uh, department of science and technology new delhi and uh, it is an institute where you know we uh, we uh, do uh, right from the uh, we deal with rocks of you know the very ancient rocks like the precambrian we call it when i say precambrian you can say like 2 3 billion years old rocks stromatolites early life and to the present we we do we do aerosols and we do the climatic studies the present day uh, data also so we uh, tem uh, the spatial and temporal range of what our institute researches uh, uh, is is 
space is very wide. We cover the entire you know, uh, Indian subcontinent and we have programs running in the Arctic and the Antarctic too. So, uh, and uh, as I said, temporarily we, we cover the entire geological time scale. So that is the beauty of this institute. And uh, the, the researchers that as you, uh, as the name tells you, paleo, it's all ancient, you know, sciences that we're doing. We're doing paleoecology, paleoclimate, paleogeography, uh, paleophysiography, everything. You know, and then uh, we have uh, uh, we have about 62 scientists and several research scholars that are working in different trust areas of the institute. So, with this brief inst introduction about the institute, whenever you visit Lucknow, please come and visit us. Um, and uh, today's talk, I've just divided it in a way that you know I wanted to share my experience and the opportunities and the challenges which we do, uh, which we which come in our way when we um, study uh, or we are working in these extreme environments. So uh, and their comparison to how can they become a very good analog sites for Mars. So uh, firstly, what are the Mars analog sites? Second, yeah, uh, Antarctica and Arctic. Uh, when I was there, what did we study? A brief, uh, you know, about what the research is that we conducted there. Then I'll come to the third poll with special reference to Ladakh. I'll tell you things about the, that place. And then uh, what are the challenges and opportunities there? So uh, when we when we uh, say Mars analog sites, what are they? As per definition, a Mars analog site they're defined as places on the Earth that share one or more physical, chemical, or geological similar similarity with the Martian environments, either current or the past. So anything that looks like or resembles Mars on our Earth's surface, we can call it an analog as per definition. Secondly, is that why is this analog sites, or you also call them the terrestrial sites, why are they very important? And why do we look for them? They are important because they help us to understand the geological processes on Earth, which can be extrapolated to the other solar system bodies in, other, in order to interpret and validate the data received from the orbiters or the planetary rovers. Like, you know, every time you cannot, you cannot even think to go to Mars, but um, to study the processes about the things that are going on there, we need to study these analog sites and what are the processes going on here. Then only we can extrapolate them to the Mars surface. And such data, you know, uh, uh, researchers are doing uh, the, this kind of study. So um, the second thing is that they are very, very important for optimizing scientific and technological needs, needs and exploration strategies in uh, robotic or manned mission to the Mars. So you know that you know you can test your rovers, you can test your uh, all your uh, machinery, and uh, in these in these spaces because they have <clears throat> they resemble Mars and they have some kind of you know linkage to Mars, either the topography or whatever. We'll come to that. Then uh, some sites are suited, you know, you cannot get everything at one place. So some sites are suited to test instruments for exobiological research or to, uh, and, uh, or to train samples, uh, sampling procedures for uh, field exploration. So different sites have different, um, um, you know, importance. So that's why there are many, many analog sites all over the world. And uh, other sites, they offer extreme environment that can be used by astronauts to prepare for the difficulties in the future space missions. So because, you know, whenever there will be a manned mission to Mars, they, you need to um, they first undergo rigorous training here on Earth in these extreme environments in, sol in isolation. So that is why, you know, how you, you will be best prepared and to do the best research that's needed from you. So that is why analog sites are very, very important. And uh, today we have lots of analog sites all over the world. We, uh, we uh, especially, you know, the, the hot water springs, the, <coughs> the lakes, the underwater uh, portions, the Nemo research station is there, Arctic, Antarctic, the volcanic uh, areas, they form very good analog sites where, you know, different kind of studies for astrobiology, for 
anything else for uh, you know uh, the the geology the geomorphology and the processes what's happening it can be studied so we have uh, lots of research stations in the united states and canada and uh, we have some in Spain and South America, and these are in Africa and France. We also have research stations in Svalbard, Norway, that is the Arctic zone the Arctic Circle here, and we also have the um, uh, have two research, two analog sites in uh, McMurdo uh, Dry Valley in Antarctica and Kodkochia in uh, station uh, in Antarctica. So already in Antarctica and Arctic, we already have the analog sites, they have been recognized. <clears throat> so coming to these two places first, and then we'll go to the third pole. So <clears throat> It was, um, yeah, I, as I said, I was a part of the Indian uh, uh, scientific expedition to Arctic in 2008, and I also had gone to the, you know, Antarctica in 2005 and six. It was the 25th um, expedition, uh, Indian expedition to uh, Antarctica. India is a bipolar, uh, bipolar country, and we have uh, we have research stations at both the poles, uh, both in um, in in the in the Svalbard region, in the yeah, Spitsbergen here in the Norway region. It comes under the polar circle, and then. In, in the in Antarctica, we have two stations: the Shimachi Oasis towards the you know northeastern side, and the Larsman Hill that's come up uh, recently in 2012. So uh, coming to them, uh, just a brief idea about you know what the, these the, these are like. Uh, sorry. Yeah, as we all know that Arctic, you know, it's a, it's it's an ocean and it's surrounded by land and. Antarctica, that is the opposite of Arctic, is a land surrounded by ocean. So, you know, simply opposite Arctic and Antarctic means opposite of Arctic. And uh, when you when you when you think about the Arctic Ocean, you think that you know it you it's as it is surrounded by land. So it has been known to man since since many thousand years. So the the, the Arctic has been you know explored and uh, seen since many years, but as Antarctica, it was just sighted in 1820, just, you know, uh, two centuries ago, and set foot in 1895. And only uh, since then, we've started our researches in the Antarctica. Before that, we didn't even know that this uh, continent existed, and it's the fifth largest continent in the world. Okay. As far as uh, the um, uh, the population is concerned, uh, here in the in the upper uh, left panel you see Antarctica, and wherever these red dots are, these are the countries which have stations. And in the right hand side, you can see the in orange the countries which have their research stations in in Antarctica. So no indigenous inhabitants are there, only permanent and summer staffed uh, research stations are there because Antarctica comes under the Antarctic Treaty. There you can only do research, you cannot like habitat that place. So you, you go there, there are no, the, you, you cannot stay there permanently. You can go, do research, come back and so on. And, um, in the Arctic, because I said, because it's it's surrounded by so many countries, so socially and politically, it includes the northern territories of the eight Arctic states. So all these here, Russia and United States and Canada and Greenland and Iceland and Norway, all they have, you know, they, they, it comes under them. So uh, uh, in the Arctic, um, uh, there, there is this uh, northernmost community, which is the research stations there research stations of several countries are there so uh, researchers they go there and do their researches and they come back and again it's inhabitable you can just uh, uh, the temporary research stations are there so now the third thing comes which uh, which uh, is um, you know, the, the new term that is coined is the third pole. So what is the third pole now? <clears throat> third pole, I, and why do we call it a pole? Because, you know, pole, North Pole and South Pole is because of that, uh, you, the, the Earth's magnet, the outer core conductive layer, which is like in motion with the Earth's rotation and making this kind of magnetic kind of effect. 
That is why we call it a North Pole and a South Pole because of that magnet. But why are we calling this place a pole? So this is a region that encompasses the you know entire Hindu Kush and the Tibetan Plateau and the Himalayan range, and we call it a pole because not because of any uh, you know physical reason, but because of a geographical region reason because it has uh, ice fields contain the largest reserve of fresh water outside the poles. So. You know, Antarctica is a frozen continent. Arctic, there is lots of ice and fresh water in form of ice and snow. And after that, in the whole world, it is only this area, the third pole, that has the, the, the reserves of um, ice and uh, fresh water and permafrost. So we have long glaciers like Siachen, and uh, we have lots of lakes and uh, in this area. So that is why it's it's called the uh, pole. The, a third pole. So the Tibetan plateau, it is the largest, it is the highest region on the Earth's and uh, Earth's surface, and it is a source of 10 major rivers. You know, from this uh, plateau, 10 major rivers, they which provide uh, irrigation, power, drinking water to about 20% of the world's population comes from this region. 20% of the world's population is around 1.3, 1.4 billion people. So this is a source of fresh water to so many. You can see the the Indus River, the Ganga River, the Brahmaputra, Iravadi, Mekong, Salvin, you know, the, the Amudarya and uh, the, the Tarim. So these are the rivers that really feed a lot of people in the Central Asia and in the Southeast Asia and China. So uh, that is why this, this area is very, very important. And apart from that, it is a, a global ecological buffer and enormous socioeconomic and cultural diversity is seen there, ethnic community, they reside here, uh, they are rich in uh, natural resources. It's a diversity hotspot and it does have a huge population, but the Tibetan uh, region and the higher Himalayas, there the population density is very low, where we can find some analog kind of conditions which I will be talking about. <laughs> So these were the three poles that I, I, you know, we that I intend to cover in this talk of mine. So in Antarctica, you know, the the, the the why do we why do we say Antarctica and Arctic as analogs? Because the climate is severe and very low temperatures are there. In Antarctica, the uh, terrain is uh, ninety eight percent is continental ice sheet and only two percent is the barren rock, and we have natural resources and natural hazards foot up are too much there we have these catabatic winds which are called the gravity driven winds and they gain a you know speed of about 100 and 120 knots nautical miles you know so a per hour so they are like blizzards and cyclone storms and there is volcanism at some in some parts of antarctica and then the calving calving of the ice shelf that it's it's breaking that is also going on so geographically the uh, the um, uh, antarctica is the coldest it's the windiest and the driest continent in the world and uh, during uh, summers most solar radiation reaches the surface at the south pole that is re received as the equator in the equivalent time. So just imagine. So solar radiation is, a, a, you know, uh, equal to what is what we receive in the uh, equator. And as I told you earlier, that there are uh, Antarctica is no place where one can go and live forever. So there are on, there are forty five nation signatories to the Antarctic Treaty, and they operate their seasonal and year round stations in Antarctica. And then you all you all know it's it's, uh, it's six months of daylight and six months of darkness. And when it's dark, you see these auroras, uh, beautiful uh, night lights. Antarctica is a you know pulsating continent. We call it pulsating because you know sometimes it's small and sometimes it's big. How? Because winter in winter, the surrounding water also freezes and makes the continent look bigger. But when in the summertime, it becomes smaller. So, you know, it's that is why it's known as the uh, pulsating uh, continent. <clears throat> so, uh, as I said, India is a bipolar nation and we have Indian uh, scientific expeditions to Antarctica everywhere. And the Institute that is uh, in charge of that is uh, is the National Center for 
uh, polar research and it is in Goa. They depute scientists from all over India and uh, who, who uh, intend to work in these polar um, uh, regions and they invite uh, you know, projects and uh, they go there. Sometimes students also go there. Uh, so if they are really passionate and still see, they can just apply to and have a small project what study they would like to do. And then they uh, they go to Antarctica. Uh, during our time, we used to take a ship from uh, Cape Town to the Antarctica um, ice, uh, you know, the shelf area uh, in the eastern side. And this was the ship uh, known as Pardibur in which we, our team traveled to Antarctica. So, uh, as uh, you know, uh, uh, this is the Shimachir Oasis. Oasis is here in, in the white continent would mean anything that is like, you know, uh, not white. So this is a rocky terrain, so it's known as the Shimachir Oasis. And here you have these uh, summer stations, and this is our uh, uh, station called Metri, where the winter team stays. So th two teams are staying there. Uh, one is the winter te wintering team, which stays there for 16 months, and the summer a team that goes and stays there from for December till March or April. So I was a part of the summer team. So I stayed for uh, three and a half, four months in this in this uh, place. So uh, when you come to Shimacho Oasis, it has a dry polar climate and the extreme of temperature, extremes of temperatures from warmest and coldest months range from 7.4 to minus 34 with a mean annual temperature of minus 10. And the warmest month is December and the coldest is August. And blizzards, they touch a gale speed of 90 to 95 uh, knots. And uh, mean annual wind speed is about 80 knots. It's, it's a very cold uh, you know, scenario there. This is, you know, January where the piston buri, you can see this is a lake. So the lake is frozen and uh, the picture that you see in the background, and the piston buri can just, uh, you know, go over it. So it is that cool. So we did some research here and I was doing geomorphology, landscape escape evolution. I was more interested in the lakes distributed in this area. And I went for the summer expedition because I wanted to see sample some of the sediments from the lake, which could tell me something about the paleoclimate of that area, which suited my institute's uh, uh, you know, mandate also and my interest also. So we did publish a few good papers from here. And uh, this is the Shirmachi Oasis. When you see it in the map, it's like, you know, 17 kilometers like this, 17 to 18 kilometers uh, in its length. And when you see its width, it varies from one to three kilometers. And uh, the, the, there is this ice shelf site and where, you know, that the ocean is there after 18, 18 miles uh, somewhere. And then uh, at the, at the um, southern part is the continental ice sheet, that thick ice sheet. And all these in blue, what you see scattered in the lit, in, in the below in the diagram is uh, is uh, in the sketch are the lakes. They are big and small lakes scattered over the oasis area, and there are more. There are nearly hundred lakes today, and they are being they they were they are class, classified into proglacial lakes that are from the continent still side. All these purple uh, purple area purple you know shades here are uh, the proglacial lakes. Then there are the landlocked lakes, the, all the blue ones, and then the epishelf lakes, which are towards the shelf areas, all the ones marked in gray towards the north part of the sketch. Here. So, uh, so three types of lakes have uh, were identified, and what what our researchers told us that these were the part of, of of bigger lake systems in the past. So, how did we come to that conclusion? Is that uh, you know uh, this is this is Met three when you look at from the southern side that is the ice shelf region, and this is the the lake from where we the Met three stations gets uh, you know the uh, the drinking waters are pumped into the station. So this this is uh, also known as the Lake Priyadarshini because you know our, our uh, expedition was started in 1981 uh, and our uh, the Prime Minister then uh, Mrs Indira Gandhi she started it and we all know that Mrs Indira Gandhi's nickname was Priyadarshini and uh, the lake is named after her. So this is the station and since 1981 the station is serving very good and uh, you know every year and it's it it has a capacity of about the station has a capacity about you know uh, 30 people but there are lots of summer huts outside which can again you know 30 people can stay there 
So these are small uh, huts where you know bunker beds are there and you can stay there. So uh, these were the lakes that I was interested in, and we uh, this is uh, you know the geology of the area. But basically, uh, the, uh, the the rocks in this Shimacharoises are metamorphic rocks. They are gneisses, and uh, they they basically metamorphic rocks. And um, here you can see how uh, the the proglacial lakes, the landlocked lakes, and the epishelf lakes are over these uh, the geological um, uh, you know uh, different geological suits that are present here metamorphic suits here. And what we did was uh, we looked at these five regions that are in green. We did a sediment core from all these region, regions. And then and the sediments are, you know, looked like something like this somewhere. You could see mud cracks and all because it was summertime. Summertime, like for Antarctica, it was December, Jan, Feb when we were doing this work. And then uh, we, uh, sometimes we used to uh, dig a pit and do our sampling. And sometimes we used to do uh, take a core where it was possible. Because Antarctica is a very, you know, it's, it's, it's a cold. A lot of physical weathering is there. So you, it, was not, it was very hard to get a very smooth core where you could just find mud or clay in it. But every time you, you would find drop stones, you would find rubbles and pebbles and, you know, cobbles. So this is because because of uh, physical weathering every year you know there is snow the, 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 there is the things are frozen the the water goes into the cracks of these rocks and all and then there is a lot of you know rubble everywhere so that also disrupted disrupted our sampling things but nevertheless we had a number of course where we could study and you know the lab uh, la, uh, in in the lab what we can do is we can date these sediments so we did a lot of dates on these sediments and these sediments were dated to 12,000, 7,000, 3,000, you know, different, different places, different sediments. Sometimes you also got inverted dates, like the older sediment gave a younger date and the, you know, uh, younger sediment gave an older date. And this is very necessary to understand the process. Why does the, did this happen? Because in these cold regions, you know, bio-cryoturbidation takes place. So the younger material, it seeps through uh, the permafrost, the free, because it's it's frozen, so it just moves to the lower layers and then gives an inverted ages. So such such sections we would not consider, and only the ones which we got good dates where we uh, considered for paleoclimatic uh, work, and others we did of course uh, uh, consider for the like, sediment characteristic work of that area. So we knew that. Uh, um, the sediment in this area is mostly sandy, silty in nature, and um, it is uh, the, the fills are not much. There are only about thirty centimeters to two meters, not more than more sediment in these lakes. And there were uh, there were clay lenses, of course, which did tell that sometimes or the other the lake had been very stable in uh, warmer conditions. And uh, these sequences, and we could be able to reconstruct a paleoclimatic history from thirty thousand years to three thousand years and what did we do we did a you know this again a schematic sketch what had happened was that about thirty thousand years back all these pro glacial uh, the, there were glaciers running across this shimacha Royces. And then uh, as time passed, maybe 10,000 to 3,000 years, there were big lakes in the area and the glaciers had started retreating. So because of the Holocene, Holocene is a time from 10,000 to today, we call it a Holocene period. So uh, the beginning of the Holocene started with a warmer period. So because of that warmth, uh, you know, the glaciers started retreating, but there was lots of water. So there were bigger lakes in that region. And as of today, there are hundreds of very small lakes and, you know, there are no glaciers issues as of today and uh, the scenario of Shimachar is what you've seen in the pictures that I just showed you before this. So uh, so today it looks like very dry and you know you could see some clay bands sometimes you could see these polygons hexagon structures and <clears throat> just typical of a glacial uh, geomorphology. And then, the, then we also did some paleoclimatic work. We studied different parameters, you know, on, on uh, every centimeter of the uh, uh, samples that we had taken. And we could give a very good picture of the paleoclimate in that area. And we did compare it with the Westfall Hills, the Bunga Hills, Windmill Islands, Larsman Hills, Antarctic Peninsula, where we did have some, you know, 
<clears throat> knowledge about what had happened in the last 10,000 years in these areas, and but there were lots of gaps. And with our data, we could fill in some of the gaps, and we could give a very, we could talk about a very, you know, uh, uh, constant picture right from 12,900 to 3,100 years before present. So this this was uh, one of the study, and uh, yeah, I'm not going to into the details because yeah, many of you are students here, but. But uh, you know uh, what we uh, what these paleoclimatic studies can do is that you could you could point out the places where the climate was optimum, where it was okay. You cannot quantify it. We could not quantify it at that portion because we didn't have isotope data. So, but we could at least give a broader picture of what had happened in the last ten thousand years, especially in the East Antarctica region. So this was. <clears throat> And then in the in the Shimacharoises, when you see the plant life, it is only the grasses, the Antarctic grass, the, this, this, the, the champion, and we have some uh, lichens and mosses in this area that, that grow. And that too, only for the summer months, two months, they'll be there. Otherwise, they, they just uh, go under the uh, snow or ice. The second is uh, lots, as I said, there is lots of physical weathering. You can see, you know, the rocks, the hard rocks, they, with the wind and erosion, uh, because of the aeolian erosion, the sand is picked up and, you know, it's, the, it's, it's just thrown over these rocks and in the, in the years by, they form such structures where, you know, the snow petrels they rest there. Lots of, lots of Antarctic birds are there. So this is what a typical station looks like. And you have, uh, the, these are the activities. You can go to the field in ski doos. You can do field work in, your, in, the, in the boats. You have helicopters dropping you and uh, taking you and then, you know, the piston bullies. Uh, and uh, especially in the Indian, uh, in the Indian Antarctic expeditions, the, uh, the Indian Army, Navy, uh, and uh, Air Force people, they are there for logistic support uh, to the scientists. So uh, this is uh, February and uh, it gets very, very cold again, you know, the winters are starting, summertime is over, so it's time to go. And then this, uh, as I said, Antarctica is the pulsating continent and the, the, the snow, it's uh, the, sorry, the water, the ocean water surrounding and the continent is again getting frozen. So it's uh, it's time to move. Otherwise, the ship would be, you know, caught in between uh, this, uh, this um, freezing. This, uh, the second, the second uh, station that I was talking to you is the Bharti, and um, uh, Bharti is in the eastern side here. The, the if you see the left hand side, uh, the map of Antarctica, the left western side, uh, sorry, the eastern side um, dot is Larsman Hills, and it can support seventy nine personnel. It's a very sophisticated um, uh, station, and it was commissioned in March two thousand and twelve, and. And the beauty is that you know you can go via ship and then you can just board down the ship and walk to the station so you do not need helicopter droppings and you cannot you're not dependent of the on on many of the other logistics you can just carry your work uh, your your machines your equipment and you can go to the station so and you can sleep in the in the ship itself and work in this entire area so that uh, it's it's a very good very well equipped station and um, uh, yeah, I haven't been there and it's a dream to go there uh, someday. And then coming to the Arctic, as I said, Arctic in the Neuralizant area, there are several research stations of several countries here. So we also have one Bharti, uh, so, sorry, Himadri. And uh, I was a part of this five member team when the Himadri was inaugurated. And this is our honorable, you can see our honorable um, uh, minister uh, who had come for the inaugural session of the, um, you know, of, of Himadri. And this was 2008. So we already are 12 years in, uh, in the Arctic also. So in Arctic, my again, my field was more on the sediment and uh, more of, on sampling, which I bring back to my laboratory to do the analysis of uh, environmental magnetism, textual analysis, and um, other biotic proxies, if any. So um, here we did a beach, beach ridge, but again, we were unlucky here because 
because we uh, got inverted ages because of biotrat aberration. So we could not publish in much on the uh, paleoclimatic uh, work, but we also raised a uh, core in the lagoonal areas because it was all, Arctic is all, you know, it's about glaciers and a little uh, uh, river, meandering river, and then the uh, delta. So uh, in, in just 10 kilometers, you can see everything like what we see in India from the Himalayas to the, the to the Bay of Bengal uh, of like 3,000, 4,000 kilometers. We see it in four or five kilometers in the Arctic. And these processes are the same everywhere. So and that's the beauty. It's like a mini miniature. You're seeing everything. You're seeing a glacier. You're seeing an alluvial fan. You're seeing a river. You're seeing all seeing an oxbow you're seeing lots of streams and then the delta so this was uh, what we did there there is a lot of you know um, uh, permocarboniferous um, kind uh, the the formations there and uh, because this area was very very rich in for coal and coal used to be mined once um, in the last century here so these deposits are very good <coughs> so <coughs> coming back to and as I already told you, that in Antarctica and in Arctic, both they have been recognized as the analogs for Mars. So, uh, and in analog sites, what do we they do? What do we do? We do science, we do uh, engineering, we do operations, and we also look at these human factors whether we are we, we can you know uh, we do experiments like this, uh, wearing the suit that uh, you know you could take uh, to in the manned missions to Mars. So this is the team. Um, they uh, they are collaborators. Uh, they, there is uh, Anushree who is here with uh, in the NASA space with bound to uh, Ladakh also. And uh, so, uh, uh, like I said, Arctic Antarctica already analogs, and now uh, Ladakh. We will we'll, uh, study about Ladakh. So, what is it that um, that uh, you can say? How do you recognize a place uh, that whether it could be a good analog or not? So, there is kind of a fidelity test. So, it would describe the resemblance of the analog to the to the extraterrestrial correspondent one. It is also used in comparative planetary science to express the analogy of the terrestrial side to a target extraterrestrial uh, surface too. And the classification criteria could be, you know, you could see the geomorphology, you could study the ge geochemistry and the exobiological exploration conditions there. So you have to see that. So we, 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 wanted, we wanted to see whether Ladakh uh, that is the terrestrial analog for Mars. So we had to check the geomorphological fidelity, the chemical geochemical, exobiological, and exploration conditions. So um, as we know that the red planet, Mars is dry, it's cold, it has a rocky ground. So all the researchers done till now, they tell us all this. You know, it has some loose dog. There are grounds where, you know, ice could be there. There were some rock glaciers, galleys, and we, we see folds here. And these are uh, these are papers already published. People have already done research on it. And there is uh, there are some volcanic rocks, quads, and shields here. And then we also have some papers of permafrost there. And there could be uh, extremophiles organisms that thrive in uh, in very extreme conditions. So let's see whether uh, where in India can we find such conditions which we can say like uh, they are analogs for Mars. So um, uh, we we know uh, I'm here I'm only talking about four sites, showing you four sites, but I'll talk in length about the uh, Ladakh site. But uh, you know there are several because India is such a huge uh, you know country. It's a subcontinent with a very diverse uh, you know physiography. We have the mountains on one side, very high mountains. Himalayas entire 2,500 kilometer range. Then we have the arid west, we have the plateau area, and then the, the coastal areas and northeast and northern plains. So we have very, very diverse areas and many, many, and many biodiversity hotspots are also there. And uh, the, uh, the, there are uh, beautiful sites that can be analog, uh, can be chosen for analog <laughs> researchers. So um, 
so the arid west as i said the, the the third desert in the in the western side and then the run of kutch which is a salty marshy land for miles and miles you can just see that the lunar crater uh, in the middle in the in the middle state madhya pradesh and then uh, sorry maharashtra and then the entire himalayan range so there are so so many analog sites in mars so now we'll go to ladakh so this is the super lake site where it's it's a it's a lake no more it's a wetland now but you there is a saline there was a saline uh, ecosystem lake ecosystem and you can see the brine uh, you know the lake uh, the salty crust or the world Ladakh comes under the cool arid deserts. All these light red are uh, these uh, cool arid deserts of the world. So just near the equator, uh, you know, the, you can sorry, just near the tropical areas, you can see entire um, cool arid deserts here, and some in the, in South Africa. <coughs> sorry, sorry, I have a bad throat. excuse me so we have some in south of uh, america and so it's a part of a very cold arid desert so you know you see this so uh, you could you could see uh, if you've seen some photographs of mars you can see some you know it it looks exactly the same with some kind of initial drainage pattern and this but of course this is ladakh and then this is one of the sites that we studied it's a paleolithic site paleolithic means an a, a place which was a lake once upon a time in the past so <clears throat> so we can we can say that uh, planetary exploration uh, techniques can be studied can be explicitly understood and well interpreted only if the processes on the terrestrial surface of our planet earth are well studied and well understood so to understand all these processes how was this formed what led to the formation of this what is the sediment that is that is it is characterized of how is it here so when we understand all this here we can say what is there on the mars on mars we know that cratered highland of moderate to high relief isolated knobs and masses rugged mountains and uh, even even these uh, rivers they they have been the conglomerates outflow channels they have been uh, you know reported and these are suggestive of mass movements you know you can only say outflow channel can be formed when there is lots of water pressure only you know then only a outflow channel will be formed so if there is an outflow channel in mars so we have to you know say that there has has to be a mass movement of you know a, a, a catastrophic flood kind of situation so uh, so all these um, movements like uh, uh, mass movement landslides catastrophic floods active fluvial processes erosional and depositional work of wind ice and water have taken place and formed the features on the mars as they are forming it in the uh, ladakh region and then the chemical analysis by mars by pathfinder indicates that silica rocks are there and uh, they have differentiated parent materials the geologists the the astrogeologists they study on what the rock type is what is the com chemical uh, composition of the rock etc thus earth surface processes they can build a strong upsurge of interest from to space program and a geologist and a geomorphologist makes significant contribution to space exploration we the moon or the mars because of their back background and experience with the earthy forms constituents and the processes so what what the topography is what it is made of and what processes made this kind of a landscape uh, because they know about it the geologist and the geomorphologist so coming to ladakh um, uh, i'll just uh, yeah hurriedly go to the through the through these uh, slides on ladakh and they very interesting so this is the newly formed uh, union territory i only already told you that this region uh, it gives birth to 10 major rivers of the of the um, indian subcontinent uh, and and the tibetan plateau region and when we see the geology of that area you need not get you know uh, confused by this i just want to point out here that in ladakh area we have 
all kinds of rocks. We have uh, igneous rock, we have uh, volcanic rock, we have metamorphic rocks. So all these, all these, we have thrust volcanics, Valamayur formation is a sedimentary rock. And then we have the Kargil formation, which is a sedimentary rock. Again, Pangong formation comprises more of metamorphic rocks and so on. So we have ultra basic rocks, we have ophiolites. So we have a variety of rocks that are here in Ladakh. So it's, it's uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 astrogeology point of view, Ladakh is a very, very important and a good site. Now coming to, uh, you know, why, it, it, as I said, the altitudes here are very high. It's above 3000 meters above sea level. So, uh, and it is a cold arid desert. There is no vegetation. It's above the sea tree line and it witnesses extremes of temperature. There is intense frost action. And as I said, as in Antarctica and Arctic, Ladakh also is, uh, you know, uh, physical weathering is pronounced and we have signatures of neotectonic activity. So if I take a transect from Delhi uh, or the Gangetic Plain to right across the Himalayas, you know, what I, you, I see this kind of a profile. And the the winds that uh, the the monsoonal winds they are just blocked by the uh, outer outer ranges of the Himalayas and leaving behind this is the rain shadow zone where Ladakh comes in so something like this and Ladakh area it receives precipitation in form of snow in the winter seasons December Jan Feb as snow from the winds that are coming from the Central Asia the westerlies that you call it, okay and the rest of India gets its monsoon from in the months of July, August, September, from the uh, you know Indian summer monsoon range. But when the Indian summer monsoon in, is intense, this this uh, also penetrates into the Himalayas and gets gives rain in this region. And this is very very you know it's disturbing for that region because there is no that there, there is no vegetation to bind or hold the soil and everything you know it can it can cause flash floods and uh, devastate you know lots of hazards in that area so basically the area is a cold uh, it's it's an arid uh, it has an arid climate the major geomorphic landforms that you see are, you know, you'll see some alluvial fans like this, you'll see uh, moss, moss mounds, as you call it, typical, you know, periglacial uh, topog topography. You have glacial, proglacial lakes there. You have paleo lake sediments also, and uh, lots of them. And then there is uh, fan to cutting, uh, alluvial fan to cutting off by the rivers then. You have present day lakes also, which are saline, lots of lichens and all you know that kind of um, uh, uh, fauna it, uh, flora it grows there and uh, this, this these are the major major landforms that one could see in that area and there are lo lots of loose debris. This debris is again because of physical weathering as, you know, there are rocks and rocks that are just sliding down the slopes. And then you can see beautiful folds like the textbooks, you know, it's, it, uh, uh, they are there. And there is no vegetation to, you know, obscure them. So you, you can really, really see them. And you can see the Himalayan orogeny, how, you know, the compression has taken place, how the extensions have taken place and so on. So uh, as I uh, had just said that uh, available evidences suggest that water was present in the form of oceans, in the form of ice caps and glaciers, lakes, rivers, out, uh, flood outbursts, groundwater and cryosphere in the, in the mass. So um, we, we can say that there had been uh, long lasting hydrological cycles in the Mars too. So uh, the, these and these we have evidenced by the topography, by the geomorphological and mineralogical uh, mineralogy that's present in the red planet. So, you know, we are kind of, uh, yeah, these are some of the pictures that show you that, you know, there is some kind of a channel structure, craters, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, outburst the channel that's diverting into two and so on so all these pictures that come from mars to us so we we can study them better because on field we see these structures uh, in ladakh 
So, for example, I'll give you a few examples, run through a few examples. So, you know, this is a picture um, uh, of an alluvial fan in Mars, and the similar kind of, you know, thing we see it in the Ladakh area. So, we can say after, when we study this, we can say, you know, this was the angle, the spread was this much. So, at least we have an idea of what we can interpret uh, seeing the, um, uh, the satellite imageries of uh, or the, the photographs from the Mars area, okay. Secondly is again another picture from Mars on the right hand side. So you see these lines that you see, you see. and then when we were studying um, Ladakh, we could see the similar kind of patterns that are formed due to melting of the seasonal ice that were formed. You know, every year that there was there was ice, and then when this when the spring season came, ice was melting, and it was just taking the uh, finer finer material down, and it was uh, almost the slope was more than forty five degrees, and then you can form lines like this. So similarly, there is an alcove, there's a channel, and there's an apron which can be studied and related to what it is in Ladakh and what it is in Mars. Third thing is the sapping. So in Ladakh also, what we were what we were observing that you know you're walking on a plain ground and suddenly there is this you know uh, soil and water it's just gone down. So um, so the gullies and similarly uh, every every year this gets widened and widened and gullies are formed and the same process has been taking in up in Mars and groundwater sapping uh, is creating these gullies in the Mars also. So uh, these are two images from the Mars. Then we come to cross bedding. So uh, this is a paper by Sarkar et al. 2019, cross bedding at uh, a light toned mound in the Juvianta Chasma. So here they, 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 the authors, they say that they, they, they record these excuse me, uh, cross beddings. And similar kind of, you know, cross beddings, we also see it in our uh, uh, fluvial lacustrine sediments in, in, uh, in, in Ladakh. This is the Spituk section. It is a fluvial lacustrine set, uh, section. It was a lake once upon a time. The time is like uh, 12,000 to nearly 3,000. Again, the Holocene time. And you had a very good set of interplay of the fluvial and the lacustrine sediments here. And in that we see these cross bearings, which, which we understand that how they were formed and then we can, uh, like Sarkar et al in their paper, they've done the same thing. Then uh, we uh, see lots of meandering channels and oxbow lakes uh, on the Mars surface. And um, these are the cutoff meanders also we can say. This is because we, we, we see them uh, in the area and we can like relate them in the, cut, the cutoff meanders and the meanders we can see in the bigger rivers like the Ganga and the Brahmaputra also. So this is a very common feature for uh, fluvial and uh, sedimentology, you know, uh, person. Then, uh, like similarly, steam is emerging out of multiple alcoves here. And uh, similarly, we can see it in the Sarkar et al. They have again given one more of the Juvianta Chasma, like the stream that's originating uh, by, uh, you know, mul multiple uh, alcoves, similarly as in Ladakh. So uh, it is very important uh, to, to know the processes what are going on in the earth, especially in such analog sites, uh, which can be analog sites. So like the debris flow, you can, you can just relate them, these, these features on our earth to these features on the Mars surface, like you can call them a debris flow because you have an example. There are lots of debris flows in Ladakh and then you can see the amount of discharge in just one flow in, a, in a, just one hour, you can have a massive discharge. So this was one where this size of you know, rock, this is Pragya, uh, one of the students from IIT uh, Mumbai. And uh, so uh, you can see the amount of the, the, the boulder size just beyond her. So uh, the, such, such uh, uh, pressure, or uh, the power uh, these uh, hydrological processes, the debris flows, the mud flows have, then they can uh, bring it down. So you can, if understanding the um, intensity and the spatial, uh, you know, um, uh, area where it can it can spread on, you can you can well interpret the ones uh, that are uh, in the surface of the mass. 
So uh, the arid cold desert of Ladakh has certain environments where microbial life can be studied and the photosynthesizing microbial communities can be looked at these glacial lakes and also these, uh, you know, environments of the hot springs. So everything, uh, all these, all these features, you can, you, we can just see on the surface of Mars and we can also study about the microbial communities. How, like uh, to study cyclophiles which thrive at a low temperature, this is the best place because it's frozen for six months. And you know, these, these uh, glacial lakes, they are at an altitude of above 5,000 meters above sea level. And then they're frozen uh, mostly throughout the years, except for a few months, one month or two months uh, in the summertime. So where uh, yeah, then you can just study the cyclophiles, then, um, we we do a, a, because um, ours is a, a you know paleoscience institute and we have a very strong biotech proxy uh, yeah, uh, people they, they uh, expertise here. We also do analog studies uh, of these lakes that are you know melted during the summertime in the Ladakh region and uh, uh, few a few um, uh, like uh, the biotech uh, distribution is basic you know we have lots of algae there so diatoms are very good uh, if proxy to study then thecomabians but thecomabians are heterotrophs so they they uh, they, sh they tell us that you know the lake is quite old they have been you know the primary producers only then the thecomabians would thrive on there so if you know the food chain you can link it and you can also see you know whether the lake is very new or it is a, um, a lake that has a paleoecology also so these are some of the forms of th diatoms and thecomabians and pollens and spores pollens and spurs of taxa that of course as i told you there no trees grow in this area but the pollens and spurs of pinus and abs you know you, you are finding here because they are telling you the wind direction of the southern and the western side they're coming from himachal or the jammu and state the greener kashmir area they come to the, this side and deposit in these lakes so and their accounts are very very few and then <laughs> there is another feature that you see on the uh, Mars surface are these polygons in the, as I showed you in the peri periglacial regions. And here in Ladakh, you can see this is the highest pass of the world, Khardungla. There uh, you can see these stone polygons beautifully placed. And um, uh, they, they te tell about, uh, you know, uh, how the process, how these are formed. So um, then permafrost, which is very, very important. I wanted to show you these pictures. Permafrost is a frozen um, ground, and it has. If you would call it a permafrost, if it's uh, it's there frozen for a few years. So, but it's shrinking now. Our studies tell us that you know the active layer uh, is somewhere 70 centimeters to 130 centimeters. But in the future, it is just going to be some uh, you know it it will penetrate down more than 1.5 meters. Maybe it could go till three meters also. So that's a very very uh, danger that we are we are gauging for the future because uh, we called it a third pool because we had the freshwater uh, reserve here in forms of ice, uh, glaciers, and permafrost. And permafrost, if it degrades, so we lose, a, this is a wealth, you know, uh, for the future, for future water. So uh, we also have lots of hyposaline, hyposaline lakes and wetlands, and they can be, uh, you know, uh, where halophiles uh, can be studied. And then uh, this is Sokar uh, Lake. It was a lake. It was a lake. It, there used to be lots of water, but now uh, over the years you can see how it is shrinking. These, they, they were, it was a bigger lake, and then it's it's shrunk into two parts. And today you see moss mounds here. And there is a very good paper by Gurman in 2010, who have uh, who has shown us the paleo shorelines. And then the paleo shoreline of the lake was 98 meters. So if you fill the sea area by 98 meters of water see you could you could just imagine the extent of the paleo lake so these are things that the paleo climatologists they they do they reconstruct the you know back the back portion the ancient portion what must have happened 
Apart from the saline lakes, we, uh, they have uh, hot springs where the thermophiles uh, can be studied. Thermophiles are organisms that thrive at a very, very high temperature. The so several hot springs in Ladakh. So psychophiles, thermophiles, halophiles can be studied in Ladakh, like in one place. And then you also have the aeolian deposits like the Hunder sand dunes. And this is the NASA spaceward bound team, you know, where, who visited uh, the Hunder, uh, Hundred dunes, and there between the dunes, there is a uh, you know, uh, there, there is clay and uh, clay deposit showing some ponding kind of a situation and a fluvial activity where cross bedding is shown. So, uh, all these, uh, and then uh, we see that it's more of quartz, obviously, it's a dune, it has to be silica and uh, and elite, elite because it's a cold area, uh, uh, you know, area, so cold arid desert. So, we we get a portion, you know, some percentage of elite. In the uh, uh, these are the, the constituent of these sand dunes, and these uh, this is uh, the or, you know uh, the the carbonate and the <laughs> inorganic uh, ca carbon is more and organic is very less in this area. Not only in the dunes but also in the lake sediments. We have lots of lake sediments like this. These are ancient lakes. There used to be lakes. The water has gone, leaving behind the sediment, which is layered and can be studied for paleoclimatic studies. And because of this loose materials, it is dry and there's lots of wind. So these dust devils are there to be seen everywhere. And especially after two o'clock, you will see a lot of, because all a lot of loose material is lying around the valley. So this, uh, the wind catches it up and, you know, distributes it wherever there's an obstacle, sand runs are formed like this. So Ladakh is a barren high altitude cold desert with a Martian lunar and a lunar topography. It, it's, it features some of the best sites to study as to geology due to extreme cold conditions, no vegetation, high altitude and a desertic environment. The geographical setup, dynamic and active geological setting of the young mountain belt of the Himalaya and the science capability of the trans Himalayan ranges support the study of astrobiology as well as astrogeology. The geomorphic features and the vast exposures of sediment can be helpful in generating data on paleoclimate, climate modeling, tectonics, earth surface processes, and help us in a better understanding of the Martian geomorphology, hot springs, sulfur deposits, and uh, to study the extremophiles in these environments. And the lakes and the paleo lakes can, can reconstruct the ecological and the paleo and the climatic processes involved. So with this, when we come to, uh, we, we see the fidelity thing, we say that geomorphologically, geochemically, exobiologically, you know, Lada qualifies to be an um, analog. And Amity University uh, has recognized this uh, and a permanent station uh, is coming up in the Soker site. And it would be India's first exploration training camp. And it would be starting in 2021. So everybody should join it. It's a beautiful experience to work there. And uh, with these words, I would uh, say special thanks to Ranjan Pragya and Ashri Rakesh and uh, for sharing some of their photographs. And uh, thank you everybody for being there. Um, thank you, Siddharth, over to you. Thank you so much, ma'am. I think uh, that was one of the most comprehensive talks we have had so far that would cover all the uh, research that takes place in Ladakh as well as the polar regions. So this is the first introductory talk that we've had that allows us to do this. So thanks a lot for that. And also thank you for a shout out to uh, the station that is coming up. So perhaps I can just talk a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, so I will, I will leave the uh, uh, website link on the uh, chat box. So we are working towards conducting some Mars analog training. And uh, so basically opportunities for researchers, students, and teachers to come to Ladakh. We have attained permission to do research work in the Sokar and Puga region uh, for four months uh, every year over the next three year period. And uh, we are working towards establishing the research station. Um, but while that is being established, we want to already kickstart the activities and uh, utilize the permits that we have. And because the station as such will be something that can support, uh, like other Mars analog stations can support only eight people to 10 people. But uh, we are also looking into the possibility of camping for students who can go and they'll be led by 
science leads and instructors and they'll be given an opportunity so we have just announced an expression of interest form which is there on that page and it will allow students to register themselves and uh, we are currently working out the different program activities that we will be conducting there there will be different levels of uh, activities so for beginners intermediate people and advanced people depending on whether they are very new into uh, sciences they are mainly looking at the basic uh, experience exposure to field work or if they are intermediate they have some theoretical knowledge of astrobiology and they want to understand the fundamentals of field work and then advanced level will be more for masters and phd students who already have some background in this and they want to work closely with the scientists so this is just to give an overview of what we are planning to do and this is open to students from all around and uh, i think uh, the indian students should really make use of this opportunity because every year we see many students wanting to do astrobiology and analog research so we are trying to put something together so i would recommend you all to uh, register yourselves your interest and those of you who have registered we will be sending out emails with the uh, more details as to how do you sign up and hopefully in the month of january towards the end of uh, january we will be posting all the program activities so that people can uh, book their slots so that was mm -hmm. all from uh, our side let's see i would uh, encourage students to post questions i see john has joined us as well uh, john if you are with us hello hi great great to have you with us yeah john of course uh, for those of you who do not know dr jonathan clark he is the president of mass society of australia and he has been he's also an adjunct faculty member at uh, our center of excellence in astrobiology at amity university mumbai and he's been the science lead uh, now for almost 5 uh, years helping us uh, uh, you know design and define uh, science activities in in ladakh so it's always great to have you around john i'm going to take some questions i'd encourage participants to post questions um, i see some questions have uh, kind of already been answered but uh, let's see there's a question from hitangshi have there been any evidence of metallophiles anywhere in the analog sites in ladakh perhaps telling us about the extremities in chemical composition in different places you know uh, yeah researches in ladakh as per the analogs haven't yet started i think starting in that now and we'll be uh, focusing on these uh, things so it will be nice if you can uh, come forward and uh, tell, give us some short projects which can be taken up in different sites because ladakh as a whole is a big it's a big geographic area and there uh, as i told you the geology also it's it's different uh, uh, there we have all sorts of rocks so we need to uh, see which which portions can we just go for metallophile studies or the other studies so uh, this needs to be developed now so it's the start so i feel you people would do it of course in the coming years we we feel this uh, this should be uh, done in ladakh exactly so uh, hitangshi I, i i see from your questions you you uh, definitely got a background in uh, in geology or maybe even geochemistry So if you're interested in working in Ladakh and if you have a project in mind definitely do uh you know uh, send it across and we'd be happy to enable you to work in the region if needed um any more questions from students or other participants there's a question from yes vasri so on what basis will you select candidates so currently we are still designing the program um it will be open for uh, uh, three at least three months each year so we are calculating how many uh, seats are there and how many participants are coming so if we reach a uh, situation where the number of candidates are more and uh, the weeks are less yes we will have to have a selection procedure in place it will really depend on uh, the merit of the project what they are planning to do so there will be some projects that will be listed on the website which the students can take up uh in that case they will have to basically write to the particular we'll be uh having a representative scientist for that particular project they can write to them and work with them out a project if they are proposing their own project then it will be just based on the merit of that project and also uh at this point of time we do not have uh 
like a selection procedure in place but this is something that is being that is being worked out and ideally speaking yes we'd like to see uh, as many students as possible to be able to visit and it is open for 3 years so i'm sure if nobody gets somebody does not get a chance this season there'll always be an opportunity to go again so now the question is from satyarth i have a background in computers and robotics lacking my knowledge in science domains what kind of projects will be supported so ma'am i would like to ask you uh, in 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 your field uh, what kind of technologies are critical uh, for doing geomorphology related work so you know for geomorphology basically ours is more of a field field science and then uh, for uh, climate and for uh, the the biotic proxies we do a lot a lot of uh, uh, lab work also <clears throat> right from maceration to uh, looking under the microscope and then we also do the sem and the edax studies so these are sophisticated electron microscopes and all that are there so um, i don't know whether from uh, computers and robotics uh, we could really uh, you know accommodate some people but of course uh, doing it uh, like uh, if if amity or the other institutes can take part uh, on the robotic side we can uh, we can do uh, like the experiments on the ground yeah in ladakh mm -hmm. testing testing the uh, like you you do uh, yes, so that so basically i can i, I can try i can also <laughs> absolutely so i can also write a bit about i can also talk a bit about uh, robotics so for sure you know when you're talking about mars exploration a lot of the surface operations have to be autonomous so whether you are trying to uh, navigate on the surface whether you're trying to operate a particular instrument or a camera or you're trying to drill there is uh, definitely a, a significant amount of robotics that is involved whether that is a moving arm or a moving roving vehicle so i would encourage you to read more and more about the mars rovers that are operational right now what kind of uh, science instrument packages are placed on them so even if you are not directly a science uh, person you are more of a technology person you will you will once you read about these projects you'll be able to identify uh, what are the exact requirements that are needed there are several rover trials and rover challenges that are conducted uh, for this next year we might not be able to do a comprehensive rover challenge per se because it takes time to announce it and at least one year notice period is given from the time of announcement till when the rover challenge is held and these are also very extreme environment conditions uh, so we do not want to you know take students there and put them under that kind of a stress right away maybe down the line we might plan a rover competition but nonetheless if you are having a group of uh, friends and you are already working on some kind of a robotics project which involves perhaps a small rover or any kind of uh, uh, robotic manipulation it could be a arm scoop for example or a small drill for example you can think about those kind of things there are several kinds of kits that are available and if you can program something that is able to operate autonomously and complete a particular task whether that is collecting a sample or doing a, a remote sensing or a, a spectral hyperspectral analysis for example and if you would like to demonstrate that you can test it in your uh, backyard at home and then you can bring it after the initial tests with you to ladakh or any analog environments and you can talk to the scientists who are involved who can help you identify which other kinds of target rocks they would like to have analyzed for example and then you know you can fine tune it so these are like some ways in which i encourage uh, students to uh, think about how can you use your existing skills moving into the science domains uh, i'll also answer the next question about uh, uh, registration are the candidates supposed to form teams so if you already have a team you can register on behalf of the team if you do not have a team i would encourage you to have an individual registration and uh, once you have registered yourself uh, and later on once we have more information then you can form the team because you everybody has to apply again anyways when they do the final bookings where you have to do the payment for your particular slot and we confirm the dates for which you are arriving and all those things so even if the team is not yet formed i would say still go ahead and register okay any more questions so um, maybe i have one question for vinita ma'am 
so ma'am uh, what is the plan for next year are you uh, because i believe the igc was something which was going to happen this year and you are all prepared for it and unfortunately mm-hmm. it got cancelled it did not uh, happen even in november so what is the field campaign plan for you for uh, 2021 2021 yeah because we do have uh, projects running here and uh, but uh, they are more of uh, the human climate interaction projects uh, and 2021 to 25 we've been asked to uh, give uh, new projects because the other five year plan begins yeah you know we go mm. by the thing <clears throat> so we planning to uh, put in a project a small project on this and for that maybe you know the amity uh, will be collaborating with us and in that project if we have a in house project and we can talk about it because we have a mo you know so we can start our work for the next four years under mm-hmm. that project. absolutely so, uh, yep. that was in 9 and we talked to the director let's see if it if it goes then uh, next year we can in uh, august uh, september we would be able to be have some funds for a field work at least a joint field work there and Perfect. take some So, yeah absolutely that is very exciting ma'am so uh, we can talk offline about what are the requirements and we'd be happy to support you uh, from our side um in terms of uh, student opportunities uh, do you normally take summer interns what kind of opportunities are there and actually my question uh, should be a little more personal to you uh, when you were a student initially what kind of opportunities did you take up that made you feel that you know i i wanted to become a scientist okay <laughs> yeah oh my god <laughs> Twenty uh, years, twenty and thirty years down the line, I'll have to go and take. Uh, you know, science had already always, you know, fascinated me because the mountains had fascinated me. The topography had fascinated me. The clouds, you know, forming and how do they come? The monsoon, everything. So yeah, I used to read a lot about it. And uh, then uh, because I was from a very small town, Kamau uh, University, in Nepal, it's it's a very small hill station. and then we weren't very really exposed to things but our teachers were fabulous like uh, professor k s valde we just lost him he was a padma bhushan padma shri so uh, people of that stature they had taught us geology so um, they they were very good in inculcating that and then later when we joined phd they exposed us they used to send us go go to GRI do your samples because as a university we didn't Kumar University didn't have so many facilities so we got exposed to so that is the best thing I feel that one should venture a lot you know even uh, any student is coming to Lucknow so if should they if they if they should make it a point to search for the institutes of their interest and just go in because uh, that really it uh, it widens your uh, scope your knowledge you need you meet people and then you know things work out. so uh, that had happened with me and uh, then uh, after doing my p my phd between that i went to pakistan uh, for a conference and that time was the time of the kargil war so i don't know how i went to pakistan peshawar university there i met my uh, my german mentor who was chairing the session in which i was like presenting and you know things worked out there then i went for the dat fellow you know he he recommended me so uh, if you if you have you in this field you have to venture you have to talk to people and then only you have you can come out with good uh, projects good ideas because you have some idea the other person has some ideas when you join it it becomes a big idea so you know to float and it becomes interesting for more people then it's not just your like just geology it could be computers and robotics and that is what astro astrobiology is you know you need to have biology in it physics chemistry every everything so uh, the, i think uh, students should do that they should they should venture and they should be they should not have a hitch to write to the professors and anybody they should just just and today you're living living in an email uh, you know it's so easy contacting people and uh, so it's so easy our times we used to write letters and then it used to go and whatever but this is so easy so to make contacts to to discuss things virtually so i feel uh, this this should be there this uh, passion should be there to connect to people various kind of people yes so i think i think i think, uh, I think yeah. uh, especially field scientists i have observed are uh, generally a lot 
uh, more social and willing to work with the people because the job requires it demands it you cannot just stay inside your lab and close yourself off so i think for students who are interested in becoming field workers uh, it is very important for you to step out of your comfort zone not just physically but also mentally you should be willing to uh, meet people from other labs talk to them have that kind of uh, openness uh, to to take on new things i think that is very very important great uh, any other questions from anybody else we have already run over time but uh, it has been such a enthralling uh, lecture uh, that i do not even realize when the time has passed so any last questions okay. i see that no. there are some students who have also joined from uh, overseas like some people have joined from uh, south america and such so there it's like really early in the morning <laughs> so because there i i see some familiar names because of our astrobiology course that was running and there were many students from uh, uh, guatemala and colombia and other places so hopefully once the live session is is going to be recorded and sent out so we we'll have more uh, more and more yeah. people watching this great so i think uh, uh, thank you so much uh, vinita ma'am it has been a pleasure as always to talk to you and uh, on behalf of uh, amity university i'd like to thank you for taking your time out on a sunday and talking to the students and uh, we'd also like to speak to other scientists at bsip so if there are other people who you think we should get in touch with uh, uh, let us please do let us know as well uh, uh, who can share more of their uh, insights from uh, their experiences working in the field and sure, sure. Uh, thank you so much to all the participants for joining in today and uh, we will be back next month with another exciting uh, webinar so stay tuned and uh, keep uh, reading up about astrobiology i think it's one of the best things that can happen to many people <laughs> all right thank you thank, thank you. you bye everybody thanks for joining thank yeah you. best wishes to all of you yeah bye thank you benita it was a wonderful talk Uh, thank you, John. John, so nice of you to have patiently listened to. Oh my God, it was long, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that was great. So, thank you. Thank let's you. meet next year, June. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I was going to say, I'm planning to schedule some meetings, uh, middle of December onwards. Yeah. Um, so I will be sharing the plan for next year, and then we can decide. I've identified, like in 2016, we had made groups. so similarly we have made groups for next year as well and depending on people's uh, availability and plans we can decide how much we want to do and where we want to do yeah. that would be nice yeah okay looking forward